Hello, I'm Todd Didier, Senior Communications Manager at the Primary Care Collab. Every month, the PCC honors leaders across the nation who are helping improve the health of our country by strengthening primary care. This month, we're thrilled to recognize Luis Probst, the soon-to-be-retired Executive Director of the St. Louis Area Business Health Coalition. Luis, welcome. Thank you so much, Todd, for inviting me to be here. So, Luis, why don't we go ahead, kick this off. Um, could you maybe tell me why you're so passionate about primary care and how you got involved in efforts to expand access to advanced primary care? I believe that everybody deserves um, a trusted and continuous relationship with a primary care clinician that truly knows and understands them. And I think when you've had that and you know that this person doesn't have to look everything up, but they really know you and uh, they've been there with you and you trust them to put your needs and issues first, um, you're more confident um, in your own ability uh, to make changes with your health. So I think, I think it's something that's important for every person. And then uh, primary care really offers patients the opportunity to get upstream of chronic disease and medical conditions. And in the context of this trusting relationship, they can really begin to chart a path to optimal health. So that's huge benefit for an individual. Um, and when you start adding those benefits up, you know, to a population, it's just gigantic what it can do for our health system and um, for us at a national level. So um, like a lot of people, um, I really believe, and I think our coalition does and the employers do, that advancing primary care is you know, one of the foundational things that we need to do to really uh, put our health system on a better path. Building on what you just finished with there, why do you think it's important that employers and businesses are strong supporters of primary care and become involved in uh, efforts to strengthen primary care? Well, I think we've seen just how really difficult it is to try to uh, improve the recognition and investments for primary care. And as purchasers of healthcare, um, that's sort of our job, right? In any market, it's the purchasers, the consumers that sort of shape that market and say what they want. And so if the system's not, you know, organizing itself in that way, then I think the purchasers need to step in and um, let their interest uh, be known. And I, and I think that it, that is happening. Um, one of the first things that I uh, learned when I came here and meeting with my employers and their first um, strategic planning is they said, we want to get closer to the physicians. There's a lot employers can do to support primary care. And um, I think um, we're trying to figure out all of the levers that we have to pull and um, have been working on some of those to try to uh, change the paradigm so that um, we can get more primary care providers. I think um, we're trying to figure out all of the levers that we have to pull and um, have been working on some of those to try to uh, change the paradigm so that um, we can get more primary care providers. Touching on that, what do you what do you think some of those levers are and which do you think are going to be are most effective? I think employers have a role in helping their employees understand you know, we're all healthy until we're not, right? I think I read somewhere once that 85% of us are healthy at any given point in time. And so it's easy to kick the can down the road and not have, you know, find a primary care doctor if you don't have one. So I think employers can help patients understand the benefits of having a primary care and the risk that they take for themselves and their family when they don't have an established um, source of primary care. The last thing you want to do is be in the ER and get a difficult diagnosis or have a family member get a difficult diagnosis and be told to go see your primary care doctor. And it's going to take, you know, five or six months to get into a primary care doctor. So I think it's helping people remember that and then giving them some rewards for having a primary care doctor, uh, considering plan design and network. So those are just some basic things employer can do. But you asked me what's most effective. And I have to say to you, the employers that have the biggest smile and the providers that have the biggest smile, uh, when they think about what they're doing for their employees, are the employers that have established um, some sort of an affiliation or worksite near site clinic. Uh, because in that situation, that employer has taken an action to guarantee that patients 
their employees will have access to a primary care doctor within a reasonable period of time. So for the people that kick the can down the road and don't have one, they have sort of a backstop there. But the most important thing is that when given the opportunity, we've just seen employees that love their worksite clinics, that they establish their ongoing primary care relationship there. The primary care providers have the time and um, to really spend it with the patient. They're not worried about running their business and you know all the things that they do, they're just there to see the patient and to promote and take care of that population health. They're able to assess things, uh, give the employers insights into what they see, look at the data with the employers and really help together shape a plan on what can we do to improve the health of this population of individuals and then collectively, uh, the population. So um, I think nearsight clinics have really grown and there is a lot of ongoing primary care happening within those settings. So Luis, what is a conception you think is a challenge for primary care? And uh, how can addressing those misconceptions lead to better primary care for patients across the nation? There's a misconception that maybe primary care doctors have that patients don't want to hear them talk about lifestyle or changes diet, exercise, sleep, those sorts of things, that people come to them to treat a problem and that they always want prescription or, or something else. And let's face it, an awful lot of practicing physicians were trained at a time when everything was focused around the chief complaint and you didn't go to see a doctor unless you had a chief complaint. And now we're asking doctors to help us realize optimal health, achieve and maintain that. Um, so I would say to you that employers increasingly recognize that you know, a failure of medicine is that we don't really build it on the, the pillars, the principles of a good lifestyle and what it takes to be healthy. And so the employers here have a strategy this year that they made first and foremost that they want the staff of the coalition to try to advocate with providers to bring um, their division of their their definition of population health more forward. And that is that therapeutic conversations between clinicians and patients uh, focus on lifestyle first, and that that's really central. It's part of the therapeutic plan and that physicians who we know understand the tie between life behaviors and health, but can they, can we help them or support them to find simple ways to nudge patient behavior, to negotiate small changes, to remember that the next time, to try to put some sort of a, you know, ask the patient, what would you be willing to do? And then have some sort of follow-up or hold them accountable. So uh, when we opened up this conversation, I mentioned that you're soon to be retired. Uh, you've had a long, illustrious clear career and done a lot of phenomenal work helping um, bridge the gap between employers and uh, clinicians and health plans. But kind of thinking about that role and your career in general, what would you say is your most significant contribution to primary care? that you or your team have made? And what are you most proud of in relation to your work with primary care? Um, we've cared a lot and done a lot of different initiatives. And sometimes it's hard to know if you'll have an impact, but I can tell you that um, just when NCQA was you know, getting started, the early years, maybe the late 1990s, early 2000s, um, and then uh, we really um, you know, tried to help people understand the importance of knowing who people with diabetes or heart disease were, because let's face it, the systems weren't organized then. So when you think back that far, we've come a long way. Everybody knows who their subpopulations are. But we did some things when NCQA came out with the Diabetes Recognition Program. Uh, we wanted Missouri to lead. Um, and um, we wanted, um, so we started calling primary care doctors and inviting ourselves over to explain the program to them. We had an employee that became very familiar with that and she would go over and we would tell them why it's important to us and their patients and why it's important to them. We'd explain how the program worked and then we would offer to abstract their paper records and later their, their electronic records 
uh, and apply the criteria, tell them how they scored. And then if they didn't make the threshold to get the designation, we would come back with folks to talk to their team because it wasn't that the doctors didn't know the guidelines. Of course, they knew the guidelines. Um, it was that the system wasn't organized in a way to really maybe support patients to following recommendations. And so um, we might bring in a nurse diabetic educator. We'd help the office staff say, hey, you know, instead of saying, how about those cardinals? You know, when you're checking someone in or out, maybe talk to them about why it's important to get that eye exam and to send the slip over or just, you know, everybody on the team kind of pulling together. And then we'd work with them and go back and abstract every so often until they met the criteria. And when we had a lot of people with diabetes, we did heart disease. And then a bit later, we had an outreach from this wonderful uh, physician from Dartmouth, John Wasson, who uh, told us about this How's Your Health. So we were fortunate to participate in a pilot using How's Your Health. And that was fun because you could see these primary care doctors getting together and really enjoying the connection with their peers and talking about how to focus on what matters most to the patient. And then coming back and giving their testimonials that when they started with what mattered most to the patient, the visits didn't take any longer. The patients got their questions answered early and they had better results uh, sharing the data. So I personally really enjoyed that because I saw, um, I saw a physician say, boy, I, I do this, how's your health? The most important score I get is how my patients rate me um, in helping supporting them be confident in managing their chronic conditions. And so knowing that primary care doctors thought it was making a difference and was making their practice just a little bit more fun and more engaging with their patients was uh, very worthwhile. I have one last question for you. This is my favorite question. It's a little bit fun, but also a little bit big. If you had a magic wand, you could wave, you can change one thing in the American healthcare system overnight. What would it be? This is one of the questions we asked at our last a meeting at the earlier this month. If you were 10 times bolder than you are and you could change one thing, what would it be? I think my answer is that I would turn the system upside down. And I would put the primary care doctors on top, you know, so we would start with primary care and, um, you know, primary care doctors would help design, organize uh, and develop the accountability mechanisms for the entire system. We need to elevate the role and the recognition uh, and the leadership of primary care across the entire system. Well, Luis, I really appreciate you joining us today and congratulations on uh, your soon to be retirement. And thank you again for all your hard work. And we are honored to uh, name you as June's primary care champion. Well, thank you. It's, a, uh, it's an honor to be asked and um, it's been valuable to us to be a PCP member. So thanks for uh, all the work that you and Anne and the team do at the Primary Care Collaborative. So thank you.